Friends, please um, take a seat. We are starting the next panel, which is focusing on uh, ESG, environment, social, and governance. And I'm very proud, proud to announce that this panel on ESG is a permanent feature at our summits, always co-hosted with TCS, Tata Consultants and Services. And Kara, um, I hand over to you, and it will be a wonderful panel. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Very good evening. Good evening. <laughs> it's a race to zero, but right now it looks like it is a race to dinner. <laughs> ESG is a very important topic. My name is Hema Kiran. I head the business unit for TCS, a proud partner for Horasis. <laughs> I live next to European Commission here, Belgium. I'm honored to have the panelists. The beauty of this panel is you have a complete diversity here, not by gender or race. When I say diversity, it is represented by the government, academia, business, Reality Check, NGO Chief Economist, and the standards. Everything that one need to have to make ESG successful, all the stakeholders are here on the stage. The way we conduct the panel here is I request each of the respected panel members to give a one minute couple of minutes view, who you are, who you represent, and maybe your view on ESG. I know the name may be a little difficult for me to pronounce, but it's a beautiful name, Dinosia Theodara. Thank you very much, Kiran. You're very knowledgeable in foreign languages and names. Um, I would like to welcome you to Greece. Uh, we're very honored that you're all here, distinguished guests and leaders in your fields and leaders of the diaspora of Vivia as well. Um, so I'm the Prime Minister's envoy for the OCEAN and on behalf of the Prime Minister, I would like to welcome you. Uh, we're very honored to have you in our country and I'm also the President of the Environment Committee of the Parliament. So ESG came to my knowledge first as a member of the Parliament and the Environment Committee of the Parliament was the first in Greece to run the ESG questions many years ago. Why was that? Because as legislators we adapt legislation on environmental issues, climate issues, social issues, gender issues, for example, good governance, and then we don't know if our legislation is being implemented, and we did really need it a reporting. So the ESG directives, regulations, what the EU is doing now is what all legislators need to, to see that people are actually following up the work. And this is why we started working on ESG, uh, and we're very proud that Greece, being a leader in, in ESG, added in the EU taxonomy, there is a, a regulation on behalf of the EU about the taxonomy, what really means to have sustainable investments, uh, and added the biodiversity dimension, because the European Union was saying, you know, when you are to be ESG uh, compliant, then you would work on alternative resources of energy, uh, to work on gender issues, etc., etc. There were some categories, but they had forgotten about biodiversity laws, and Greece added it. So I'm happy to be in a country that is a leader in ESG regulation. Uh, and on behalf of um, the oceans, uh, Greece is uh, very fortunate to be one of the leading nations in shipping. And we have developed ESG specifically for the shipping sector and the supply chain management. So we're very eager to see these ESG uh, standards to be implemented globally okay. because we're going to have a playing field globally and 
our global environment is common and we're interested in to see like every country to comply with this ESG. This is our common planet. Thank you. So you're setting a benchmark here. So I'll come back to a couple of questions <laughs> to you. Please go ahead, Rupa. Uh, thank you, Kiran. And uh, thanks, Frank, for putting it on record. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm sharing this stage with such illustrious panelists. I represent a university. It's called the Bharatiya, uh, Bharatiya Engineering Science and Technology Innovation University, also short form is PESTA U. Uh, I incepted this university uh, with a co-founder who is an IS officer and who is here, Bharatlal Meena, in the year 2017. We are relatively new and uh, we are very near Bangalore International Airport, which is, which is in the south of India. Now, um, we believe and uh, we are in this education sector because intellectual human capital, we all know, serves as the backbone for the green strategies. And we have implemented a lot of uh, programs within the university systems. We have, uh, we have uh, rainwater harvesting, we have, uh, we have recycling of waste management and many other aspects which we have imbibed. Uh, now, while that is the case, uh, we are a general university, but our flagship programs revolve around agriculture, agricultural technologies, agricultural innovations, especially uh, the, the reversal of land degradation and desertification. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rupa. To you, sir, Nasser. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nasser Manji. Uh, I've been on the board of 30 Indian companies over the last 20 years, so I've seen corporate India in, from a lot of dimensions, and a lot of them have been Tata companies, Tata Motors, Jaguar Land Rover, Indian Hotels, uh, etc. And I must say that the essence of what we're talking about was really put in by the Tatas a century ago, when they looked at the situational logic of India and said that 50% of our profits will go to Tata Trusts, which will help communities around us because that is what the community requires. This is 100 years ago. And we're talking about ESG today and CSR of 2% of profits, nothing. Yeah. So really, let's, 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 my first issue on ESG is, is it in your DNA? Okay. Answer, no, it's not in your DNA. Today we are in compliance. So we suddenly found, I, my, my professor at London School of Economics in the 70s, EJ Mission, wrote a book called The Cost of Economic Growth. Correct. And in Cost of Economic Growth, he really showed what would happen if we went down this path, and we, we have seen the result. So I think, as far as ESG is concerned, I want to just leave two or three things on the table, and we can discuss it further. And the first is that the negative externalities of capitalism and growth are just being measured. Today we are measuring our impact on society as well as the environment. And what ESG does is at least force us to really look at ourselves and start quantifying what this is. So I think this part of legislation is very necessary, very good, and in a sense essential as we move forward. But it's only the beginning. The next thought I want to leave with you with is Business as usual is not an option, full stop. We cannot carry on doing what we are doing. Look at Volkswagen, look at what's happening right across the world today. It ain't possible. We have to change the way we think. That's when I said the Tatas have this DNA, that DNA has come through. How can that DNA really work? So the third point I want to make is that ESG, that means concentrating on the environment, on the community, as well as on governance, should be part and parcel of your business model. Because the business model should also be in, uh, defined as a way in which this actually saves costs and creates a better world. It's not like adding to costs. Yeah. It's about how, now for example, in Indian, I will come back to that later maybe when you ask me a different question. So this is another thought. So it has to be, how is it being embedded? The third area is the actual governance area of the role of the chairman of the board and the selection of the members of the board. Sure. 
because no company is going to change unless the top changes. And the same old guys are not going to suddenly change your company. So we have to really look at the human factor, the people who run things, and, is it, and do they have the skills to actually deal with the problems that we are going to face in the, in the future. So let me leave with three points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very powerful statements. In the end, uh, whatever complaints, whatever regulations one can put, stand in front of the mirror, look at it. What does your conscience say? Are you doing it because of a rule, regulation? Or are you doing it for the good, for the society and for yourself? Very well said. Thank you. Elaine. <laughs> I got your name right. I'm really happy to talk right after uh, Nasser. Uh, so yes, I'm an economist. I'm a policy innovator. I'm a policy maker, but I don't really, I tend to not feel well in my conscience to just be a policy maker. So I became a policy innovator. And then I decided to become, to quit the World Bank and become a, my own entrepreneur, applying something called a triple bottom line, Nasser. Mm -hmm. Because I decided that if you want to be in blue chip only, then you have to really not just work with your conscience, but also with your procurement, with your operations, with your board, with all these people. If you start from scratch and you create a triple bottom line, then that triple bottom line cares about social benefits, measurable benefits, environmental measurable benefits, and financial measurable benefits. And guess what? They are all very, very high. So it's not philanthropy. It's not giving a dollar for just a little bit of money. It's not, people think, you know, they create a foundation and they think because of the foundation, they're gonna go to uh, heaven after, you know, after their retirement is ending. So ESG for me being a person that worked a lot for over 10 years at the World Bank and tried to push the change within the organization to apply simplification. So. We go to countries and we were not aware of the fact that more than 50% of the country is informal. And we work with the formal government, formal sector, and then we wonder why those countries do not move from the developing world to the developed world. And why they keep continuing and continuing to be in that loop. And the answer we usually give to ourselves, so we feel good as economists and to our other policymakers, is that it's politics. We don't like politicians, yeah? We like them when they invite us to go to their countries. We don't like them when they don't really manage to continue with the reforms. And then the ESG was a result of years of trial. It took about seven years for me within the World Bank to establish something called reality check analysis, mm -hmm. which basically was right on the ground. What are the elements that are needed for capitalism to operate? Labor and land. Labor meaning ID cards, people that are born and they have a birth certificate, people that die and their certificate of death is there as well. So a matrix of some sort of measuring basic stuff. And land meaning that your home has a proper registration. Not the title, because titles may be many of your property, but registration is only one. And Reality Check created exactly that, but has a, a methodology of peeling all the policies that have been adopted either because of colonization or because of dictatorships or because of other sorts of abrupt changes. And we get to 2024, and we try to bring in, ra raise the tide for all the boats to raise, right? Small and big ones. Yeah. So it's a win-win. There is no such a thing of, you know, people say capitalism is bad because it only helps the rich. Yes, if it's really not well put together. If it's an oligarchy or a monopsony, yes. But if you establish property rights correctly, and that's what RCA does. It establishes property rights in its supply side, in its definition of the product, and it's the emission of the product. So IT and technologies of blockchain are all very welcomed. Once you have simplified the process and you got into like a binomial situation 
where then all of the rest is, is properly established. So that's my three words, which were a little more than three. <laughs> Thank you. It looked like an extension of the previous panel. They talked about the coherent technology vision. It's good that you brought blockchain and the role it can also play in reality check. Yeah. Now moving on to our uh, participant Aditi, uh, about standards and about yourself and the organization you represent. Uh, my name is Aditi Hagdar. Very happy to be here. First time in Greece. Um, I really loved the previous sessions, uh, all of that. But um, today I just wanted to mention about sustainability reporting and, and standards. I think the word sustainability and ESG has become, I think, interchangeable. But many people, including myself, I have a difference of opinion, if I can mention that later. But first about... Uh, where I work. I work with Global Reporting Initiative. It is the pioneer of sustainability reporting standards. Uh, in 1997, it was created because the investors, which is a pension fund, uh, you know, they actually were very concerned about their money being at risk because of oil spillage. So that is where sustainability reporting actually got conceived. And it became a worldwide phenomena because now the GRI standard is being used in more than 100 countries and 40,000 odd companies, they actually use the standards year on year. We are not a, a group or an organization kind of having the blessings of the government, one government. Uh, there are a couple of countries which support us. There are more than 550 businesses, those who have been supporting us in many ways. Uh, there are investor groups, there are academia, there are labor organizations, and there are not-profit organizations who are part of our multi-stakeholder process of creating the GRI standard since 1997. So the standard itself is a very good reference point of not only disclosing environmental and social, economic and governance information, but it creates an impact between the report preparers and the report users. So the report users have a common reference point and so are the report preparers. So this is about GRI. Uh, my take on ESG and sustainability, just I think two points, Akiran. I know you're looking at the watch. Uh, I just want to mention here is that I think the silos of environment, social, economic and governance need a little bit of interconnectivity. Mm -hmm. You cannot actually divide them mm -hmm. and say that, oh, I'm doing good in environment and I'm doing bad in social because all environmental aspects and topics, they are connected to the social dimension. Mm -hmm. Who creates them? It's the human beings who create. Who feels that there are effects? It's on the human beings. That is when we realize that ESG needs to be important. Sustainability needs to be important. The other thing I wanted to mention is the standards are there. There are mandatory requirements. There are stock exchanges, the capital market, and the regulators, and the governments. They do have notifications and rules, which are good to mainstream, and look like that the uptake of ESG or integration of ESG will happen faster. I may have a slightly different opinion. Yes. Governments and regulators take very important role. They make these decisions. I feel also the private sector and the businesses, they themselves need to be smart because if environmental and social issues are not integrated over the years, I think the risks will grow and the opportunities will minimize. And therefore, what is important is not giving some money at the end of the profit making in the year. It is to realize how you make the profit. If how you make the profit is not through the lens of environmental responsibilities and social responsibilities, the impacts that will happen on the people and planet will come back to the business. So this is it from my side in the beginning of this session. Thank you. Kiran. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi. You ended it with profit, prompting me to go to business now to put my question to the business. But you have heard the different views. But all are converging. You heard from the 
government, you know, member of parliament, prime minister's envoy. You heard from academia. I think Rupa is going to talk a little bit more about how the universities can play a role. Then Nasser, you know, you so nicely explained around the whole concept of sustainability for the business, and you brought the example of Tata Group and on the reality check and the fact finding. You know, you also talked about technology, how you can use technology to implement to make sure that it can be a reality and coming to standards. Uh, you have nicely put in, it's not, uh, you know, standards are there. That is actually for everything you need a baseline. For everything you need a standard. Otherwise, each one will represent in their own way. It is all summing up well. So to you, Nasser, my question to you is, look, you're in the business. You talked about it already before. You gave an example. But, you know, everybody in the room and outside, they think ESG means it's expensive. You have to put more money. The return is on the long run. So how are you convincing your clients? You have a lot of clients worldwide. How do you encourage? How do you explain? You might lose some clients. For example, in Europe, some banks have started, if they take a loan, mortgage loan, unless it is a greenhouse, they don't give a loan. Three years ago, they raised the interest rate. Now they block the loan. They say, we don't want to give, especially in Netherlands. They don't even give a loan. So you're going to lose clients. So what's your view? Um, let me just talk about Indian hotels. Um, um, you know, it's a large group of hotels. It's a very prominent chain. Uh, and we've been working very, very hard on integrating the ESG. Uh, it's not just doing one of, one of them. And in a sense, even for clients, if you are a green um, entity, it actually in, enhances your positioning in the community. It actually helps. Sure. So in a sense, you know, from water, bottling plants in all hotels so that you don't have plastic bottles, um, water treatment and et cetera in terms of um, uh, 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 being water positive if possible, Energy, we are now about 40% renewable energy. We want to go to 75% in the next five or seven years. So, um, so on the energy side, on the waste disposal, organic waste disposal, for example, there are all sorts of possibilities that are being looked at. So in all areas, the Taj is really, um, uh, this is not to talk about the CSR that we do, um, which is also linked to, uh, to the environment and to communities that live around our hotels. Um, so in a sense, if you take the combined bit, it's actually changed uh, our business model. Okay. That's what I was telling you about earlier. It's not something you do, it's something that is part of your DNA as you grow. It's, it's, it's not, oh, we're gonna do this for compliance sake or to tick off some boxes, etc. No. It's also economically impactful to us. It's actually saving us cost. So it actually helps us. So it's a business model that's changing. Okay. And that, once it's in internalized within the business model, that is what is sustainable. It's not like looked at add-on. Now, for example, I was also the chairman of the audit committee of Cummins. I just mm -hmm. retired from Cummins after many years. So Cummins is a diesel engine work. Yeah. Now, diesel engines and emissions is a huge issue. Uh, and we have to meet very high standards, you know, Bharat uh, 6 or whatever the latest one is. And the, the technology for that was developed by Cummins. And actually, you have diesel that's absolutely clean today. Okay. Absolutely clean. I mean, there's almost no uh, uh, no pollution. So, in a sense, it, they demonstrated that even use of diesel is going to have an impact. Um, but it costs thirty percent more. The technology costs thirty percent more. Now, that means your generators are going to cost thirty percent more. And will the market be able to take it? So, there's a cost involved in something like Cummins. It's a very different, yeah. uh, different uh, positioning. So these are two examples that I can, I can uh, readily give you. Uh, but again, 
because you have the technology, people are moving towards the clean engines yeah, absolutely. as well. You know, so it's not that the the cost is uh, being detrimental to the market. You know, absolutely. I mean, before COVID hit, <coughs> I don't know how many of you heard at least people you know in Europe and India. Some of you may be familiar. There is a technology called geothermal. You go about 100 meters down into the earth and then get the heat pump, you know, heat air that will manage the heating within the house. Before COVID in Europe, the price was X. Yes. Post COVID, and unfortunately because of the conflict that we have seen in Europe, the price of geothermal machines have gone up 2.5 X. Why? The risk that is involved in the pricing of electricity and the uh, fossil fuel, they've gone two to three times higher. Whereas when somebody installs geothermal, it's a lifetime warranty, and the cost of heating in the houses are low. So what is once expensive, depending on the situation, mm -hmm. could be cheaper. I think one has to be prepared for everything. So thank you, thank you for... Now coming to standards, you know, it's good to have a standard and a baseline. But how many standards we have? It's, it's a bit confusing for the business. You have BSRS, you have YSB, you have FRAC, you have GRI. What's your take on it? I mean, how can you have one global standard? Because there's a multinational company that implement one in Europe, one in US, one in Asia. Can you please yeah. help us? Yeah, so to set a global standard, which is one, for every country, for every sector of business, and for every scale of operation, I think it's quite daunting. Mm. Yeah, um, we from GRI we started this, you know, this pioneering work of sustainability reporting. We were guidelines, and then we quickly understood that just by being guidelines, it is not working. Correct. You have to make it into a standard. So we made that in 2016. After that, we see there are many organizations, and you mentioned about the European Union, yeah. ESRS, and then the accounting world, which is the financial accounting yeah. world. They said, no, no, we are not going to be late. We also need to actually come to the forefront and also have a sustainability reporting standard. But let's be very aware of what each of these reporting standards, they mean. Or what does it, what is the boundary of this? So two things I wanted to mention here. Some of the standards, like IFRS, they look at enterprise value creation. That means that what are the changes in the planet which will impact money within the enterprise? Yeah? GRI from the very beginning was very clear that it will be only the business activities which impact people and planet, that needs to be monitored. So it is very, very wise to first understand, what do I need to measure? Mm -hmm. Is it the impact on the people and planet? Is it my enterprise? FRAC was very good. They looked at both. They said, we need double materiality, not just the enterprise, but also people and planet, which is very important. So I, I feel that this diversity of standard is good. It brings in the understanding as we mature over the years, what it entails. And every country is free or enterprise is free to choose what they want according to their business prerogative. So companies like in South Asia, like Bangladesh or Philippines or, you know, Sri Lanka or India, who are part of the supply chain to Europe, the trickling down of the ESRS will be there on them over the years. So we have the SEBI in India, we have SEBI BRSR. By having the mandate, it's only the top thousand listed companies. What happens to the unlisted companies? Are they doing business with responsibility on environment and social issues? These companies who are also part of the supply chain, those standards need to be imbibed. But you're right, Kiran. Too many standards, 
lot of burden because lot of time and effort by people working in the sustainability division is happening yeah we we and therefore back. therefore we need to understand that it's not about one standard i think what is important is to understand what topics in environment and social and economic dimension is core to that scale okay. and you know and sector of the industry let's measure it whether it is mandatory for me or not let's see where are the impacts and can we actually take a closer look on repairing or future proofing okay because future proofing of the business will not be done by a mandate no it has to be done because of business absolutely yeah and earning money in the right way yeah i'm going to come back to you again on the standards on the how do how are we going to solve the different standards in the world but thank you for explaining very clearly the need for different standards and how one has to go about uh i'm coming back to you rupa yes the today's students are tomorrow citizens it's easy to say now we have number of courses in artificial intelligence technology literature history economics i mean you name it what are you doing you have a best innovation university yeah. how are you dealing and what's your view point the role academia can play the different facets of esg you know it needs interventions and backing from different stakeholders and uh, not only in institutions at all in all sectors now when we speak of interventions it all starts with what mr manji just mentioned starts with the board yes. starts with the president starts with setting the vision so what we did at our university is it's a relatively new university it's 8 years old we ensured that we have a long term vision for environment sustainability now we created a 50 year road 50 year road map and while one cannot engage uh, you know what we said was let us have the low hanging fruits explored first enjoy the successes of the low hanging fruits for example the campus is entirely drip irrigated achievement the camp the campus is entirely solar achievement then we say okay the entire waste is being recycled achievement you know these little successes they just give a profound sense of success to the stakeholders involved in the university and that's how the community starts believing in you the faculty start believing in you the entire ecosystem starts believing in you because you have created that prototype for them now incubating esg is especially with a student who comes concretized after 12 years of education in school the only way we can uh, you know sensitize children is start young catch them young yeah. but when i speak of higher education institutions and what we do at our university we educate youth in a two point formula one our aim is to operate resource recovery mechanisms now when i say resource resource means land water soil simplified so we we engage in different methodologies whereby we encourage them resource uh, operating resource recovery the second aspect of it that we uh, look at is cultivating a new cohort of environment engineers environment entrepreneurs mm. so these two being the aim this is what we want to do but how we do it is again you know first we need to prioritize our environment sustainability and how to set these goals we said as i said you know we set some little goals where we have measurable success at our university then we developed a structure to meet those goals with collaborations because you cannot work in silos as aditi mentioned it's never one stakeholder it's it's communities around us it's the civil society it's ngos it's the corporates who work with us and then there are scientists so we need to bring this consortium of people around and say okay here we are and with collaborations we move forward the third and the most important aspect is determine the structures and the funding needed to implement these strategies now we belong to the arid rile sima region and i'm not too sure for the for the greeks here and for the international audience we belong to an area which is 
completely arid, almost like a desert. Nothing grows there. We have created a green cover at our university, which is about 250 acres of land with fruits, with vegetables, with uh, water management, with vermicomposting, and uh, also 34 villages around us. Now, if you see from a, a drone footage or you know from a height, you'll see that there is a huge green cover where there is not even a 500 mm rainfall. We grow the finest fruits, vegetables, and this is the measure for my impact. It's what we are doing at that location. Yep. So I think this creates the confidence in people, in communities, as well as students, and then they are self-motivated to move forward. Very good. You not only teach, but you also make your alumni yes. healthy mm -hmm. in a green zone. <laughs> Very nice. Yes. I come to you, ma'am. There is a big debate out there. On one side, you have developed world. Might be a bit political. On the other side, you have the developing world. There is a lot of measurement and discussion. You have, when it comes to carbon emission, the measurement per person, per nation. It's an everlasting debate. Now, you are from the land of Alexander the Great, who also has a connection to India. What's your take on this? How do you, how do you look at it? Will, will it end the debate, or do you see Greece playing a role? I don't see it anymore as a debate. <laughs> Um, actually, being in the negotiations for climate agreements um, all these years, uh, of course, uh, the question is there. How are you going to have all the players mm -hmm. to be able to contribute equitably into the climate, for example, uh, crisis and other crises, of course, the water crisis, the food crisis, etc. And we have two big lists of countries, the developed countries and the developing countries. We have two different annexes, and we definitely respect the principle of shared, common, but shared responsibilities. So the responsibilities of all the countries are there, they're diversified, so the developing countries should gain more mm -hmm. things out of these negotiations, out of these agreements. And this is how I actually respect and promote this principle. As part of the IPU, I'm the deputy uh, president of the Interparliamentary Union, as well on behalf of the Greek Parliament. And I always say that we need to work on more finance, green finance, towards the support of developing countries to cope with all the challenges that we have, the common challenges, but we need to give more finance. Mm -hmm. You know that it was recently created the loss and damage fund yeah. in the climate agreements. And there is another fund as well for resiliency in the developing countries. So Greece is really supporting these funds. Okay. And also technology transfer and know-how. And this is why we are here. This bilateral meeting between India and Greece and the private sector and the academic sector as well. We're meeting here and see how we can move forward in the era beyond these differences. Because you mentioned about Alexander Great, of yep. course, he said something like the main idea of Alexander the Great is harmony, how to achieve harmony. And this is what Greeks want, to achieve harmony with other nations and to achieve harmony with nature. And we can do that by sharing values and also knowledge and also finances. Mm -hmm. All these are important. So what I say, say is that we have to take two things in account. As I said before, that this diversity, this differentiation between developed and developed countries, they don't exist, they don't exist. That, that much. That's Greece, for example, we are a developed country, but we are not a high emitter of yeah. CO2. So actually, we have many permits because okay. Greece is an agricultural country, we are a tourism country, we're not a heavy industry country. Okay. So we're somewhere in between. And India, it is the largest you know, population country in the world. And we see you as a, a, a rising power among the G20 countries. So you're very powerful, 
And trust me that your power and our power is not in the population, mm -hmm. is not in money, it is in the mind that we have, in the intelligence that we have, and in the souls that we have, in our values. So let's go beyond these categories and work together to achieve what we should achieve for us and for the future generations. Thank you. Maybe we have to reconstruct the corridor <laughs> what what existed many, many centuries ago in harmony. Ellen, you are the reality check. You heard from four different parts of life. What's your take? Well, um, that's like a catch-22 question. Um, <laughs> so, I like how Dionysia presented and, and engaged um, also my mother country, Greece, into this conversation. Um, indeed, India has moved in the last, since, since with a new president since 2014. You've, you've gone through epic, epic growth. Um, your, your pillars of development do not just depend on the population. They depend on, um, allow me to say, a DNA that the Indian people have, which is entrepreneurship and, and, um, and continuous queries, questioning, trying to find solutions. Um, never settling with what they have, but always looking for something something a little different that would also be a little better. And I may say that this is a commonality between the two nations or the, mm -hmm. two, um, the two mindsets. And it's not by chance that Alexander the Great did go through uh, different places and ended up there in India. Um, <clears throat> now, there is, there is one challenge and one thing I like a lot about the Greeks and I also like about the Indians and I'm, again I'm going to say thank you Dionysia for mentioning this. Um, we are very pragmatic, we are very realistic. We Greeks recognize that we have been kind of like the cradle of civilization and a lot of things stem from here but we also realize that a lot of things need to change and improve and develop, and we do not uh, we do not ride on um, our historic or orals, but we are all very much willing to engage and improve, and partner with others to learn more. And I notice a very similar behavior with all of my Indian colleagues, as a matter of fact. And I see, for example, that one of the pro issues that um, is very well identified as well from your president is that element of informality. 20% of your economy is informal. In terms of labor informality, a higher percentage of your economy is informal in terms of your asset informality. Um, we have very similar numbers, but we're a smaller country. So we don't really splash the world with it. So imagine if you would adopt reality check, imagine the tide your country will create. Imagine if the genome, I mean, I applied reality check in Peru and I was teaching this summer in Switzerland, um, young kids in, um, MBAs and postgraduate students, a big chunk of them were Peruvian and I was teaching them about how could they use economics and incorporate technology and blockchain to economics for growth. Um, the Peruvians that were there were 20 to 27 years old. They did not know the name of their president of their country. And we also had Swiss students, they did not know the president of their country. But we had French students, English students, Greek students, some African nations. They all knew the first, the last name of the president of their country, where the president <laughs> lived, how many oh children God. the president had, who was the president <laughs> married to, you know, which school did they go to, yeah? Let me tell you, I was super excited that the Peruvians did not know their president, <laughs> because it doesn't matter. Because 67% 
of, of what was called poverty is now middle class in Peru. Mm. And they call it new middle class. Mm. And yours truly was one of the people that coordinated this. Yeah. So it's extraordinary to go there and say, we are part of the new middle class. I mean, can you imagine this being transmitted and embodied and organized by India? You will not just be called the engine of growth, you will just be leading it and everybody else will be looking at you. Let's, and let's. I think that would be a, an interesting uh, aura and, and, and vision. I mean, I enjoy that vision. Oh, absolutely, thank absolutely. you. Thank you for your positivity around it. Uh, I'm just doing a reality check right now on the time. You have uh, 15 minutes. No, I have a lot of time, <laughs> but before I put one more question to you, I want to invite the audience to put any question to the panel. Anyone would like to pose to the panel? Uh, can we have the mic, please? I think they're used to the template. Let's give the mic at the end. I think uh, it's a very interesting uh, discussion on ESG. I think most of the discussion evolved around E and S, yes. not much on G. Correct. So when you talk about G, I think uh, you're seeing very large reputed corporations collapse because of one mistake. So how that can be addressed and what governments are doing or corporates are doing in this context. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, it's a good uh, point. I would let uh, Nasser, maybe you could respond, governance. Well, governance is a, a, a critical component of the company. Um, that's why I mentioned the role of the chairman and the role of the board, because that is the head of governance. Volkswagen cheated on emissions. What does it say about the board? What does it say about the chairman of that company? The shareholders? And the shareholders. So, you know, it is, you know, the point is that the DNA of a company, the culture of a company is set by the tone at the top. Extremely important. Now, that's true of a government as well. I mean, it's what a prime minister, what, or the cabinet, in what, what is it that they set for the, for their nation, for their, for their country. So, in a sense, I don't think that anybody can do anything about it. Uh, you know, I saw that government can appoint a better board. Uh, but it is a matter of shareholders and investors um, uh, requiring much more accountability from the board. Um, I've just argued very much that uh, people saying, how effective is a board? And I said, it's only as effective as the leadership of the chairman. Very often, the boards just go along uh, agendas, you know, tick, 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 any yes. comments, yes, yes, over, bye-bye. Other chairmen are much more diligent. They can even, uh, how many chairmen of boards actually spend time with each individual director? And what they expect of that director? How do they bring their expertise to bear on the, on the company? Now, that's critical. It doesn't happen. I've been on 30 boards. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So the point is, there are lots of ways in which we have to turn this around. And the only way it, it can be done is if, um, if uh, somehow uh, we have a, a forum where one would constantly discuss the effectiveness of boards. Thank you. Is it okay for you? Uh, would you like to? Explain from a society point of view and a government? Actually, not on behalf of the government, but practically speaking, I see a burden um, on the implementing the governance aspect yeah. in both India and Greece in the private sector. Just because in both of the countries we have small and medium sized enterprises, we don't have large enterprises that they do have a governance structure on their own. So it is very difficult for small and medium sized enterprises to develop the knowledge and the capacity for the governance aspect. So we first need to educate them how to do it, like a family business. Yeah. What is the governance structure in the family business? It is very difficult. And then it comes, how are they going to implement also environment and social 
with the areas well. So we need to educate them and we need to empower them and maybe we need to finance them before they're able to turn effectively into the governance structures and the governance criteria. So you're very, very right that this is a very weak point and yeah. we need to work more on this. Yeah. Thank you. May I, may yep. I say, um, what I find very interesting, though, is that what what really sustains everything is trust. Yeah. And trust can only be established if there are incentives. And by incentives, I mean simplified procedures and processes. So if it's absolutely impossible to engage in um, having a board member meeting the director because it's going to be too complicated to do it or a director to do the opposite. Uh, equivalently, the boards of a government sometimes are siloed completely and the ministers cannot really necessarily communicate with their prime minister easily. The prime minister listens to their advisors, to his or her advisors. Um, there is something called really the CEO disease that the CEO being either the president of a country or the prime minister or the CEO of a, of a company that gets to somehow have around him people that will tell him what they think he would like to hear and not really what he would like to hear, yeah? So how do you break that? Because I know a lot of prime ministers that I've, I've worked with 42 countries and presidents that are all very nice people. When they were two years old, they were not hit by their mothers and fathers. They didn't have traumas. They were nice people, right? But they don't do nice things when they're there. And then you sit there and you wonder, how on earth, where, where did the logic go? Where did common sense go? And you realize that 24 hours a day, he or she is going to only talk to three people. And all information is filtered through these three people. Not even his board. Yeah. They're not even listening to the board, not even to the member. So what I usually do with my reality check is I try to simplify procedure mm. and make it as simple as possible. That's how you can get your information better. Sure. Because when she comes and says, I'd like to get some measures, oh my God, that's like, that's a task of its own, right? So yeah, you create sure. another task force that you'd see once every 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, sorry, uh, just coming from a technology background, I can relate it to it. The world has seen a lot of large scale business transformation, technology transformation initiatives. We used to call it a waterfall. Mm -hmm. When you say waterfall, I tell you what to do. You go develop it and bring the product back. About 10 years ago, we moved into what you call as agile. What you explain now, agile is about behavior. It is about getting the truth from different corners of enterprise, not hierarchical way. Everybody is same on the floor, and everybody has a voice. Everybody has a viewpoint. So how do you collect what's going right, what's going wrong, and then take the measure? It's about a behavior. From the behavior, you gain trust. Absolutely. You just described reality check. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I didn't know. Now, ESG is about doing good. Or at least you feel good. So in one of the things we want to do as a panel is give you back a little bit more time to prepare for your dinner. But before you get up, I want to give the final <laughs> dialogue to you and to each of you. Maybe take a minute. What's the takeaway you have from your fellow panel members? What do you want the participants to take away when they leave the room in one minute? Less than a minute. Well, I was really, really honored to be with all of you on the same panel. And I think that we should work together as a private sector and the academia and the government at, on the global level to yeah. work more on this, but especially on a bilateral mm. case. Greece and India, we have started a strategic partnership after the visits of our prime ministers to yeah. the respective countries. And we need to give more substance to this strategic partnership. So let's start a strategic partnership on ESG 
and let's start working on this through the university and education, through the private sector, on the international level. We're here and let's have something to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Yes, collaborations are the way forward between industry, between academia, the policy makers, but also I think these efforts, uh, universities do not have a recognition in place for developing their green strategies. You spoke about this in the morning. I would like to just throw it up to all the panelists. Why not we declare an award or a recognition by the Tata and Horaces for the best university following and you know, the one which you know, follows the ESG, has systems in place, and also has spread the knowledge about ESG and trains the students on ESG. So maybe this, uh, you know, this would be a great start to encourage India itself as 1,350 universities and more than 640,000 institutions in Greek too. So maybe a recognition which we could have in place that can steer people towards that carrot that, okay, your, your efforts are being recognized. And it could start with Horace's TCS award. <laughs> We'd just like to throw it no, up. We'll <laughs> consider, but Frank is not in the room, but we have we to will let him talk to him, <laughs> Horace, and is there an award? Yeah, maybe Definitely. recognition. Rec uh, it definitely helps. Uh, I have a broader take, quickly. I think we are fiddling at the edges, quite honestly. It's very important for the standards, it's very important for reality check. I think the sorts of things that you're doing are extremely important, but we are fiddling at the edges. Today we are in an existential uh, crisis on climate. We are producing more coal than we have ever produced before. We are having more aircraft flying than we've ever had before. India just bought 1,000 aircraft. So what is this about emissions mm. and about our little companies saving, et cetera, et cetera? What are go global governments doing? Look at the global government's uh, retraction of the commitments it made to COP. Okay. One by one, they're, 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 they're reneging on, on, on money that they are committing. So we are not in a good place, I'm sorry to say. But there's a lot of very hard work, and we don't have time. So I think this is, a, this is a, uh, really a point at which the, glo the globe has to get together. I want to leave you two quotations from Native Americans, yeah. right? One is from Chief Seattle. The earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. Man does not weave the web of life. He is merely a stranded. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. That's what we are doing. Yeah. And we are not recognizing it. And an Apache tribe saying, it is better to have less thunder in the mouth and more lightning in the hand. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Right? So I think let wisdom prevail, basically. We have a lot of work to do, all of us. Yeah. And I think we have to do dramatic work not fiddling work. Oh, I so love it. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm Elaine. so happy that I'm, I, I engaged in the panel and um, I met you all, the new friends. And I'm also always talking after, uh, after Nasser because um, my game is a big game. I'm not interested in fiddling around. <laughs> My mom gave birth to me not to be a public servant, which is a wonderful service to be, but that's why I left the World Bank because I felt it was a public servant. And um, my interest and my call is to transform hmm. the 70% informal yeah. by changing the 30% who manage the resources of the world mm -hmm that all 100% mm -hmm. are using. Mm -hmm. So here is a request, G20. I am just one person and I do not, I'm not a president of a country. And if I were a president of a country, I'm an American and a Greek. I could only, for, for changing this, I should only be an American president, but I wasn't born there. <laughs> so I'm lost it. I cannot, I cannot run it on that side. So I'm asking you guys, 
G20, India. Go run, take reality check, and impose a change in the economic development paradigm. 1945 Bretton Woods is dead. Dead. We're holding on to it for fiddling around. The same way so many other post-World War II organizations yeah. are dead. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Um, ESG, you want to call it? Fine with me. Marketing issues, you want to call it? Fine with me. The genome of each country is the genome of each person. Unless we give each country an incentive to participate, yeah. unless we rise the GDP for everybody and include a serious, general, strong middle class, it will not be sustainable. It will reverse exactly. all Both the time. So let's go get that change of the, yep. you know, development paradigm. Sure. Very philosophical. <laughs> Reality check. I think listening to all of you, I feel that it should, should not be the fight about different standards. It should not be the fight between developing and the developed world but one thing let's understand what are the impacts we are causing number one mm. number two are we aware of the carrying capacity of this one world which is with us whether we are in india whether we are in greece whether in us it doesn't matter are we really aware of the carrying capacity how long are we going to actually survive who reports for our survival duration? Mm -hmm. Who do we report to for our survival duration? I don't know. Let's not wait for a crisis to happen. And we are talking about corporate reporting. We are talking about quarterly reporting. We are talking about graphs which should grow up. That's not a problem. But if we continue to do this quarterly reporting, and bring ESG to be integrated into that, I don't think we are doing a fair game. We really should understand the impact, the carrying capacity, and where am I as an individual? Where am I as a policymaker? Where am I as a businessman? Where am I as an educationist? I think every person in this world is creating an impact. And are we aware of that? I think it is very, very important. The last point, uh, Kiran, we have overshot, I think. Yeah. It's blinking. I think, you know, ESG, sustainability, corporate social responsibility, they are all, you know, integrated. What is important is businesses, and you spoke about governance, someone asked a question. The governance, whoever it is, are they thinking that, what am I going to feel at the end of my life? Am I going to die with regret or am I going to die saying that I did something good and I'm not, I'm regret free. I'm sure who discovered, you know, dynamite, where there are questions of different crises of labor risk, where there are questions of mining, where there are questions of different kinds of water, uh, you know, effluent which is killing people. I'm sure they regret and therefore ESG, carrying capacity, and the impact. If me as an individual, I'm aware, what is the regret I will have or not have, I think I can take all my decisions accordingly. So from my side, this is it on ESG. Thank you. Thank you. Nice thoughts before we go for the dinner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, you know, Sia Theodora. Thank you. Thank you, Rupa. Thank you, Nasser. Thank you, Thank you Elaine. Thank you, Aditi. So if you have any questions, we can continue the discussion over the dinner. So thank you for the wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, he, she's coming.